Watch this. Idaho's largest university is using taxpayer dollars to push a socialist agenda. At least, that's what some lawmakers believe, and why they want to pull funding from Boise State. BSU's president says that's an inaccurate ideology, one that will only hurt students. They say you can get almost anything at Walmart. Go in for groceries, come out with a barrier against a deadly virus, before you're even eligible. How that's happened for a lot of Idahoans. And here we have Idaho, winning her way to fame and firsts, especially when it came to women's suffrage. How Idaho helped lead the rest of the nation to equal women's rights. Nearly two years ago, 28 Idaho Republican lawmakers sent a letter to Boise State University calling the school's efforts to address gender-based violence, to create inclusivity, diversity, and equality on campus. They called those efforts disconcerting. It made those lawmakers uncomfortable. They said those programs cost more money, resulted in segregation that they divided people into groups, and goes against the Idaho way. Now that was back in July of 2019. So fearing their voices haven't been heard since then, some of those same lawmakers are now making the money speak for them. Idaho's legislature sets budgets for the state. Probably know that, including state schools like Boise State. And this year, BSU has seen its budget shrink by more than $400,000 because lawmakers don't want Boise State using state funds to push a perceived social justice ideology, complete with courses and messaging on campus. That budget still needs to be approved by both the Senate and the House, but we wanted to know how BSU felt about a deep cut like this and what that would mean for the campus. We do not want to appropriate funds. We don't want funds expended for courses, programs, services, or trainings that confer support for extremist ideologies, such as those tied to social justice, racism, Marxism, socialism, or communism. That was the message from Representative Priscilla Giddings during a budget hearing last week for Idaho Higher Education. The Joint Finance and Appropriation Committee voted in agreement on the sentiment. As a result, Boise State was targeted with a budget cut. Line 3, which reduces 409000 for Boise State University to remove state-supported social justice programming. When you're talking about 30,000 students and, and 2,700 employees, um, that's, a, that's a tough impact to take. Boise State President Dr. Marlene Trump says even with other sources to fund the university, like tuition and student fees, the cut hurts. What dollars translate to at, in a university um, most often is people. And so $409,000 is a significant figure because that's a lot of um, potential people's salary. President Trump says she wants lawmakers to know the university hears their concerns about curriculum and programs on campus, but she's not sure they have the full picture. Trump says she's talked with critics of Boise State's programming about the environment on campus. Some people have called it a marketplace of ideas. They're, they're actually quite comfortable with the idea that um, uh, students are introduced to a full range of ideas from the left and the right. They just want to ensure that all of those positions are being represented. And that's something that matters to all of us. We want to really ensure that students feel like a, a variety of different perspectives are available to them. And, and we think that's often very true. And where we don't see that, we want to address it. We should be uh defunding the social justice critical race theory agendas and programming that are that are being um, advanced on our college campuses using public monies. Representative Ron Nate's comments in committee have drawn support from those who believe Boise State is using state money to push an agenda in line with Boise State's diversity, equality, and inclusion initiatives. Trump hears the concerns but says there's something important to clarify. First of all, what we aim to do at Boise State is teach people how to think, not what to think. That's really fundamental to what a university is. Trump says she very much wants to have a collaborative relationship with Idaho lawmakers that includes critical discussions. She admits she hasn't made the progress she had hoped to on that front because of the reality of living through a pandemic over the last year. So not to make excuses, but it seems like there's just this, this disconnect right now between lawmakers and the university and it seems that it's kind of exacerbated by how we connect right now is that is that fair i would say that's true and and it has been a grief for me not to 
um, spend more time down at the Capitol this year because a lot of the questions that people have raised in legislative meetings, um, I could have answered and would have been so happy to answer. Trump says contrary to criticism of her and the university, she does deeply care about what Idahoans and legislators think about what happens at Boise State. She says no excuses. She wants to make that more clear to those in doubt. I'm really going to have to give a lot of attention to um, our legislators so I can answer their questions directly, but also um, really reach out to folks in the state so that they understand what our goals are, what our aims are, and what we're doing here on campus. You know, I think that there has been a misperception um, that there's only a certain set of ideas that are being taught at Boise State. And in fact, Boise State is this rich and, and complex environment with so many different ideas. And I think they would be delighted by many of the things they saw. They would disagree with others and they would see our students and our faculty and staff in dialogue about those ideas. All right, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but that 409,000, basically about, well, less than 1% of Boise State's overall budget of $240 million. So what does that compare? What about the other budgets for Idaho's other public universities and colleges? Are they also facing cuts? Well, actually, the state uh, higher education budget overall, Brian, is actually up that about $400,000 from Boise State's budget is actually going to Lewis and Clark State College. So the overall budget is actually going up. We're just seeing Boise State getting a cut there. You make a good point, though, Brian. I asked Dr. Trump about that in the overall scheme of things. Is this a lot of money? And she says every dollar counts at this point, especially during these times. And she also pointed out that a lot of private money that would traditionally come into Boise State Date. Well, some of these private companies and donors, they're hurting too right now. It is tough financial times. So again, every dollar counts. Uh, Brian, again, all of the higher education appropriations, they have to pass the House and the Senate. We saw last year that the appropriation budget uh, for uh, in the House got kind of stuck. So we'll see if this is actually the final version of the education budget that gets passed by Governor Little. All right, so let's keep an eye on this, Joe, and see where this ends up. Thank you very much. All right, more testimony at the State House today over Senate Bill 1110. That's the one that would increase the number of legislative districts needed from 18 to 35 to get a voter initiative on the ballot. Senator Steve Vick of Dalton Gardens, he's the bill sponsor, and he says the bill does not necessarily increase the number of signatures needed, just requires that signatures come from every state or every district in the state. He says it gives ruled Idahoans a voice in this whole process. Those opposed, though, say it gives rural districts more weight by allowing just one district to veto an entire proposed initiative. During testimony this morning, Representative John Gannon used Senator Vick, or asked him, I should say, he asked Senator Vick a question we've often asked ourselves, especially as early as last week on this show. How many, how many initiatives have made the ballot in the last 25 years in Idaho? Senator Vick. I'm not sure. Oh, I was just thinking that that would be an important fact to know as to whether we have a problem with the initiative process or not. Uh, and uh, would you agree that that would be something that we should find out? I think that it's important to be, I guess in my mind, it's important to be not wait until what we might perceive as a problem. Okay, that kind of seems to be a theme though lately in the legislature. Proposing and passing laws or trying to pass laws Things aren't really quite a problem in Idaho, like last year's Fairness in Women's Sports Act. Don't worry, though, Senator Vic. Let's take a look at the answer here because we kind of did some research for you. Since 1996, or in the last 25 years, there have been 10 voter initiatives and four referendums that have made it to the ballot. Of those, two initiatives passed, Medicaid expansion in 2018 and Idaho State Tribal Gaming Compact in 2002. There were several congressional term limits initiatives that actually passed in 1994, in 1996 and again in 1998, but those were deemed unconstitutional with the latter one being repealed four years later. So much for listening to the voters. And if we go back even further to when voter initiatives and referendums became legal in 1933, there have been 37 total that have been brought forth out of the, or to the state, to the voters. 30 voter started initiatives and seven referendums. Of those 17 were made into law and still stand today, which includes things like adopting a board of dentistry, establishing a state lottery commission, and retaining Idaho's right to work law. So 37 in the last 84 years, which averages out to about one every two years or so. 
It's not as easy as it is, uh, which is the point. Or does, it's not as easy as it seems, right? Which is the kind of the point of some of those who signed up to testify today. 97 people signed up, in fact, but the committee only had time to hear 24. Of those, 17 people were against this bill and seven were in favor, which is about 70% against the bill. Not that it mattered. The committee voted along party lines 12 to 2 to advance it to the House floor, which means if it makes it to the governor's desk and he signs it, it would go into effect immediately. Idahoans would be able to file a referendum to overturn that law if that happens. And the last time that happened successfully, 2012, when voters overturned three so-called Luna laws on education. So we've established that an overabundance of voter initiatives on Idaho's ballots, not so much of a problem here in the state. Also not a problem, voter fraud, apparently. Between 2004 and 2017, more than 5.3 million votes were cast between primary and general elections in Idaho. Of those, there were 10 cases of election fraud in Idaho. And of those, only four actually involved voting. It's according to a 2020 study from the Heritage Foundation, which claims to promote and preserve conservative public policies. With that in mind, you should probably know there are four pieces of voter legislation making their way through this legislative session to make elections more restrictive. That includes Senate Bill 1110, which is the initiative bill we just spoke of. There's a bill that would require all voters to have a driver's license or state issued photo ID. And right now, if you don't have either of those, you can still vote by signing an affidavit of identity. It would also eliminate the use of a student ID. Oh, and there's even a bill that wants to stop college professors from offering extra credit to get students to vote. Then there's House Bill 223, the ballot harvesting bill that would make it a felony for anyone to take more than six absentee ballots to a drop box, and only if those six are members of your family. But even in the bill's statement of purpose, it says Idaho does not currently experience significant problems with ballot harvesting, but this legislation would help prevent such an outcome in any Idaho elections. So how do we settle on those six? Well, rural lawmakers worried it could ultimately hurt those who don't have easy access to a post office or an election drop box. A few of them even said they too take their neighbor's ballots sometimes to avoid several people having to drive dozens of miles away. So we mentioned those other two bills. Yeah, again, there is a driver's license or if you, you have to have a driver's license or a state issued ID right now to vote. And if you don't, you can sign an affidavit, but they want to take away the use of a student ID as well. And again, there's also a bill that's in the legislature that wants to stop college professors from offering extra credit in an effort to get students to vote. Again, these are intended to make voting not so much easier, but a little bit harder. All right, onions, check. Rice, yeah, okay. Eggs, got that. COVID vaccine, huh? Impulse buying, just got a bit broader and it costs you nothing. A trip to the grocery store could get you a shot in the arm, even if you're not technically eligible yet. All right, the good news, everyone's eligible to text us. So grab your phones and send us your questions, your comments, but no complaints today. Let's save those for tomorrow. 208-321-5614. Make sure you include the hashtag, the 208, and of course, your name. We'd like to know who we're talking with.
I mean, it, it worked. We, we did not expect a call same day, especially. This has been the reaction of a lot of people who have signed up for a no waste COVID-19 vaccine wait list. We've all heard about the short shelf life of the coronavirus vaccines. Both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines can last up to six months frozen. However, once they are thawed, while the Moderna can be kept refrigerated for about 30 days, the Pfizer vaccine only five days. So once it is opened and ready to use, it needs to be in short order. But sometimes people cancel their appointments last minute or they just don't show up at all. And pharmacy techs are left with unused doses that they need to get into arms, which is why these no waste wait lists started popping up over the weekend. Knowledge of this list or several of these lists made their way around Idaho, specifically the no waste wait list at the Garden City Walmart, where people not in the current priority category were getting vaccinated. It's the same Walmart where Tony Schlangen and his wife got their shots yesterday. Tony told us they've been extremely safe. They haven't gone to restaurants or bars or done anything public for about a year to avoid catching COVID or spreading it to family and friends. And when the vaccine was released, like a lot of us, they were very excited. And every Tuesday, Tony told us at 2:30, they would jump on the state's website for a COVID vaccine update just to see how things were progressing. It's also how we realized that 54 years old and without any medical conditions, he wasn't scheduled to get his shot anytime soon. We went on a whole bunch of websites and saw where we were going to be on the list, which was way at the bottom, like the last people, you know. How'd you find out about this no waste wait list? A friend of ours texted us. She got news from a friend of hers who got news from a friend of hers who got news from a friend of hers said that uh, there was a bunch of cancellations at the Walmart in Garden City and that we should get down there and put our name on the list. You know, when we went in and got on the list, it was written down on a college ruled pad of paper. And, you know, she took our name she said, okay, you're going to get a call from Arkansas, you know, pick up the phone and you'll have, you know, 30 minutes to get here in order to take, um, to get the vaccine. And about four and a half hours later, we got a call uh, saying to come in and, and get the, the vaccine. That seems pretty simple. Right? Uh, we, we're still like we, it, euphoric. We can't believe we actually got the vaccine, so. Okay, so on the other side of that euphoric feeling, there's also a little bit of, of guilt. I mean, you're not quite in the eligibility range yet. Yeah, so I, I keep talking myself off the ledge. You know, there's, there's a bunch of people who need it more than I do, who, who would probably get really sick. Um, but at the same time, you don't, you don't want the vaccine to go to waste. And talking to the uh, professionals that were there that were administering the shots, um, they said they had, they had to use them. And they had more, at least the person I talked to, they had more cancellations and no-shows than they did um, people that were signed up on the wait list. We saw other people there um, that were our age or younger um, also getting it. So, you know, the, the point is for all of us to get inoculated and, and to not feel guilty. So, yeah, there's, there's still definitely a little bit of guilt there, though. You said you're relatively healthy. Yeah. Uh, you're not super old. Why were you so interested in getting on a list and getting this vaccine? Well, I mean, I don't want to die. I mean, it's the number one reason. Um, I don't want my loved ones to get ill because of me or my friends. I want to travel. I want to go to a restaurant again. I want things to get back to some sort of normalcy. After all, that's the goal, right? Getting back to some sort of normalcy. All right, now before you jump in the car and head to the Garden City Walmart, here's what we know about it. Yes, they have a no waste wait list, or as they call it, the waste avoidance shot list. But no, they are no longer adding anyone to it, at least not right now. When I spoke to the pharmacy this morning, I was told they have enough vaccines for about 200 appointments a day. And that leaves a lot of wiggle room for people to not show up. And as you heard Tony say, they had a lot of extra they needed to use Sunday, in which 44 people who didn't have an appointment got a shot at the Garden City Walmart yesterday. In fact, on some days, they just offer it to shoppers just walking down the aisle. Imagine walking into a Walmart for cat food and coming out with a sore arm from a COVID shot. We were told if you happen to be in the store between 2.30 and 3 on any given day of the week, you might have a shot at getting an unused shot. 
That wasn't the case today, and it's not going to be the case every day. And it's not even at every Walmart. There are 26 Walmarts in Idaho giving out COVID doses, six of them in the Treasure Valley. We also called the one on Overland Road, and they only have enough vaccine for about 20 or 30 shots a day. But they also have a no waste wait list, and they have room on it. When we did this story a couple weeks ago, we learned the major health systems like St. Luke, St. Al's, Primary Health, they don't have a no waste wait list. Albertsons, Albertsons pharmacies, though, they do. Best way to find out about it? Contact your local Walmart or Albertsons. And there's no way to know if this is how they will keep doing it or for how long. It obviously depends on demand. As Tony told us today, these providers, like nearly everyone else, seem like they're just trying to figure it out, how to make sure all this vaccine doesn't go to waste. If we've learned anything from Queen Bay, we know who run the world. And thanks to thousands of activists in the early 20th century, we now celebrate International Women's Day today. Last call for today, anyway. Send us your questions and comments about the show, or about anything, really. Numbers on your screen, 208-321-5614. Include your name and the hashtag, the 208. Kind of a bumpy start to International Women's Month here in Idaho. Probably remember last week, Idaho lawmaker made a comment that any legislation that makes it easier for women to leave the house and have their children raised by others isn't a good thing. Remember he said that? Well, he later apologized saying what he said isn't what he believes. Those comments though are a reminder of just how far women still have to go in pursuit of their equality in this country. It wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that women really became vocal. Even starting a nationwide campaign for change in 1908, a group of women marched through New York City streets demanding better pay, shorter hours to work and voting rights. Later came by the way of the 19th Amendment in 1920. But Idaho has always been ahead of the trend, ahead of the curve when it comes to women's rights. In 1896, Idaho became the fourth state to give most women the right to vote. For 24 years, we joined other Western states in joining the National Women's Suffrage Movement. 
101 years after that 19th Amendment was passed, women in the U.S. still working for things like equal pay. Still not the same right now. According to the 2018 Census Bureau data, women earned on average just 20 or just 82 cents for every dollar earned by men, which is about $10,000 less than men make per year. Those numbers are proportionally lower for women of color also. Pandemic hasn't helped it either. According to the National Women's Law Center, more than 2.3 million women have lost their jobs in the last year, many of whom did so, they say, to stay home and take care of their families who were forced to stay home. So on this International Women's Day, take a minute, reach out to your mom, your grandmother, your sister, your aunt, cousin, friend, colleague, neighbor, anybody that is female and wish them a happy Women's Day.